Hello friends of YouTube, welcome to another episode of Mr. GM Fan. Today I've got a couple of really good articles out of The Furrow, that's a magazine that John Deere published. Uh, I'm reading a couple articles out of The Furrow, uh, dated uh, May, June of 1969, volume number 74. Um, the first article I'm going to read is a, is a pretty good article that's still relevant today, and it's titled, How Much Can One Man Produce? Uh, it was written by a gentleman by the name of Steve McGill. He was one of the field editors at the furrow. Uh, and the second article is Agriculture, Good Medicine for Deer World. That was actually the uh, editor's opinion. Uh, the editor at the time, a gentleman by the name of Ralph Reynolds. So sit back, enjoy these two articles. Hopefully you'll find them as educational as I did and also relevant in today's time. Thanks and enjoy. How much can one man produce? Written by Steve McGill, field editor of The Furrow. Here's what farmers are learning about pushing labor outputs to the limits. Pick one word that characterizes modern commercial farmers and it's likely to be efficient. Pressed by steadily rising production costs, they've shown an astonishing ability to stretch time, energy, and money for greater production. Everybody knows this, but a few people realize the length and breadth of this stretch. American farmers are increasing output per man hour at the average rate of 6% a year. That annual increase in productivity is more than double the 2.5% annual increase for non-farm private in industry. The average output of each farmer has multiplied many times over in recent decades. Almost every farmer has contributed to this accomplishment. There is more to life than work, of course. Each farmer should not necessarily produce everything he can, nor should he necessarily want to. It is likely that he will necessarily have to just to stay in business. All the same, the soaring increase of productivity in agriculture raise, raises an intriguing question. With current technology, how much can one man produce? To answer this question, the Furl talked to farm management experts, production economists, but especially to high output farmers themselves. 1,000 acre farm. For some farmers, high productivity lies in the big one-man operation. Gary L. Johnston row cropped 720 acres of land near Decatur, Illinois, grossing 78,784 with only 487 in hired labor, and he also added 120 acres for 1969. His total labor cost per acre last year was a low $7.66 compared with $11.15 for the average of 48 comparable farm business farm management operations. But Johnston doesn't figure he has hit the limits of the one-man operation yet. He's quoted, I think I could handle 1,000 acres of ground myself, he says. I'd want to grow mostly corn and a few soybeans. I need big machines, 130 horsepower tractors, and a six-row combine. I need to hire only some part-time help. Johnson's father-in-law now uses his four-week vacation to help Gary harvest. As Johnson's operation shows efficiency often means gearing up with big capacity equipment. Gary rents all but 63 acres and landlords want him to have plenty of machinery for timely operations. Last year, to keep his investment in bounds, Gary tried something a little different. Trading work with an older neighbor who had purchased a new six-row combine, Johnston drove the combine over the corn and soybeans on both farms and paid a low per acre cost. This meant he hired a giant machine without its purchase cost on his books. Production economists believe Johnston is approaching present output limits on a one-man row crop farm. 
Illinois research indicates that with existing technology, 12-row equipment on 30-inch centers and unrestricted access to capital, one man can, in theory, at least handle 760 acres of corn and soybeans. Total investment for this no-holds-barred one-man setup would be in the range of a half a million dollars, including a charge for land. That's 10 times as much as the 45872 invested per average farm worker in 1968. Industry's investment average is 32101 per worker. Teamwork. On some row crop operations, the quest for greater output may actually require hiring more manpower to make greater use of machinery. Fred T. Cook, USDA production economist at the Delta Branch Experimental Station, Stoneville, Mississippi, says, Two men with a, a six-row cotton planter can seed 60 to 70 acres per day, while one man with the same planter can seed only 35. We nearly double output per machine by having a one-man pit crew to keep the machine operating full-time. Fleet Benefits for top output per worker in the big multi-man operation, we look to the Wheatlands. R.G. Menzies, who farms 14,000 acres near Provost, is an example of the type of farmer we found. He has only five regular men, although he hires extra help for seeding and harvest. In other words, each worker handles a shade more than 2,000 acres of improved cropland. With half of that in follow each season, Menzies flies his own plane to oversee his vast enterprises, but he has some down-to-earth tricks too. Identical twin tractors or combines allow Menzies to sub substitute an idle outfit when a working unit requires out-of-field maintenance. Menzies uses one multi-grade oil and one grease to streamline service and, and maintenance. And he has standardized all hydraulic couplers so there's less wrestling with implement hookups. Use of identical machines simplifies field adjustments that are ordinarily time consuming. I can start a fleet of combines in record time, says Menzies, by servicing my five combines and changing settings from what they were for rye before I go to the wheat fields. When the wheat is absolutely ready to cut, I fine-tune the first combine, then my operators set up the other identical combines the same way. Same concave space, same cylinder speed, same grates, and the combines are off and running. How much livestock? Experts say improvements in output per man come dearer for livestock producers because it's harder to mechanize animal care than field work. Purdue University agricultural economist John E. Kedlick says efficient livestock farms of the future will likely have a minimum of two men to handle continuous labor requirements and allow some time away from the farm. With current technology, how big can these livestock units be? Answers Kedlick. Top swine producers can handle about 200 two-liter sows per man and will produce approximately 3,000 hogs with an investment of 150,000 per man. He mentioned swine growers Albert Galeball in Lincoln, Illinois and Orville Chamberlain, Urbana, Indiana as men who already meet these high output standards. Briefly, Kedlick adds, Top dairy units can handle about 80 cows per man with $100,000 invested per man. With sideline enterprises for beef, which will utilize low-cost feeds and existing labor and supplies only, will be under 500 head. Specialized corn belt cattle operations can handle over 1,000 cattle per man with an investment of about 250,000 per man. Of course, Many farmers can be just as efficient on an output per hour basis with smaller operations. 
This includes part-time farmers or others who seek greater output per man hour not to expand their businesses, but simply to enjoy more time away from the farm. Regardless of size, North American farmers are efficiency experts of the first order. And both big and small farms are likely to become even more streamlined in the future. Again, this article is written by Steve McGill. Second article I'm going to read is Agriculture, Good Medicine for Dear World. It was written by Ralph Reynolds of the Furrow. In developing countries of the world and among free world thinkers who advise them, there's growing awareness that agriculture, not industry, comes first in the route to national riches. There's also serious effort now to do something about it by focusing national hopes and resources squarely on farmers. It's an important shift in emphasis from the big Cold War push for massive manufacturing and public works development. And it may be crucially important to farmers in North America. Economic planners in the developing nations are finding that a little know-how, some price incentives, and yield-increasing inputs can work wonders in agriculture. In turn, a lively agriculture generates demand for manufactured goods and releases manpower from field to factory to produce these goods. The new developed agriculture is to be accomplished partly through land reform, but not in the old sense of handing, handing out subsidized sized parcels of land to peasants. The practice ties labor resources to agriculture, thus assuring stagnation of industry. The idea now is to land use reform to get farmers to grow more crops than somebody will want to buy, either within the less developed country or abroad. Land use reform is not to be pushed simply by slogan or education. The real key, planners now realize, is profit incentive. Two years ago, Charles Schumann of American Farm Bureau Federation told a group on hunger that the cheap food policy of many countries was destroying farm, farmer incentive. And he warned, to keep food cheap is to keep people starving. Schumann is noted for his outspoken defense of free enterprises in agriculture, but it is remarkable how many people, regardless of political label, are starting to say the same thing. The famed Swedish sociologist Gunnar Myrdal, after a lengthy study of 11 countries, recently urged capitalist farming for Asian nations. His pronouncements on national development may, it's been said, change the drift of history. Robert McNamara, new president of the World Bank, sees agricultural development as, a, as the major role in the vast institution in the years ahead. He's counting heavily that the small farmer, armed with profit incentive, can win the war on hunger. Even leading free world socialists now agree that nationalized agriculture can't work. And the key to abundant food supply is private ownership of land by unfettered fettered farmers. How does this affect you? If developing countries improve their agriculture, will North America farm exports decline? Just the opposite, many believe. A country that doesn't sell can't buy. As improved agriculture stimulates economic activity and manufacturing capability, you will likely have many new cash customers. Lester Brown, administrator of aid, points out that Japan, Taiwan, Israel, South Korea and Pakistan have tripled their purchases of U.S. farm goods in the past eight years, even though their own food output has been rising sharply. We're about to witness an agricultural revolution in many parts of the globe, and, it, and that's the best kind of revolution. It may be just the medicine to relieve tension, cure headaches, and reduce the temperature of the feverish world. Again, 
This editor's opinion was written by Ralph Reynolds. He's the editor of the furrow. And this was an excerpt from May, June, 1969, May 74. Well, guys and gals, that's going to wrap it up for uh, this week's uh, Mr. GM Fan. Hopefully you enjoyed both of these articles. I sure did, and I think they're just as relevant today as they were back in 1969. Please comment, guys. I really enjoy reading your comments. Thanks, and God bless.